The alarm clock rang at the usual time, six in the morning, and my wife, Anita, and I got up to start our day. I groaned loudly, pulling myself up on the edge of the bed and lowering my feet to the floor. What's the matter? You sound like an old man, she teased as she headed for the bathroom. I feel like an old man after what you did to me last night. Remembering the previous evening, I could hear her laughing in the bathroom. She humped me vigorously and gave me a very sensual blowjob. She was leaving on a business trip today and would probably be gone all week, and I would be home alone. I wasn't looking forward to it. I heard the shower running and wondered if I should join her, but then decided I didn't care. She'd gotten too much out of me the night before. Back in the bedroom later, she looked chipper while I sat there feeling sorry for myself. Come on, old man, get up and walk. We need two breadwinners to pay the mortgage on this place. Okay, I'm out of here, I told her as I walked to the bathroom to relieve myself and take a shower. Later, we met downstairs for breakfast before she headed to the airport, and I headed to work. Anita is an attorney, and we both worked at a mid-sized manufacturing facility in St. Louis. She specializes in negotiations and travels with teams when they are working outside the plant, and this trip involved negotiating a new subcontract with a large aerospace firm in Denver. She traveled several times a year for such negotiations and was away for at least a week each time. She was 35 years old and had graduated with honors from State University 12 years earlier. Anita was very attractive, 5 feet 4 inches, 125 pounds with lovely feminine features. 34, 24, 35, and I fell madly in love and coveted her. I'm Jack Fillmore, working as an engineer for the same company as my wife. I'm 37 years old, 165 pounds. I exercise to stay in shape. We both like to play golf and often get together as a foursome with friends. We met at a company picnic, and for me it was love at first sight. It must have been the same for her, because after a whirlwind courtship, we got married six months later. We have been married for seven years, and just three months ago we bought the house we live in now. We plan to start a family in this house, and Anita was just on birth control pills when she returned from a trip. We were looking forward to starting a family, and she planned to be a stay-at-home mom until the kids went to school. Our parents lived in the neighborhood, and I know they expected us to start a family soon. After breakfast, I loaded Anita's travel bag into her car and kissed her goodbye. As she got into the car to leave, tears welled up in her eyes. Pretty soon, hopefully I won't be traveling, honey. Then I won't have to go through these goodbyes. I hate them. I hate them as much as you do, dear. I reassured her. I'll see you Friday night and we'll just get takeout so you can rest. Sounds good. Bye. I watched her pull out of the garage and into the street. I waved at her, then headed inside to finish getting ready to leave for the office. When I arrived at work, I went up to the engineering department and grabbed a cup of coffee in the break room before heading to my desk. I had barely had a chance to sit down when the phone rang. Fillmore, I announced to whoever was calling. Jack, could you come into my office for a minute? Sure, Evan. I'll be right there. Evan was my boss, so I grabbed a coffee and headed to his office. When he entered, he waved me in and sat me down in a chair. Jack, I think you're going to like this. I remember you telling me last Friday that Anita would be traveling this week, so I have a little trip for you if you're interested. Gil Hawkins, our service engineer in California, is sick and can't deal with a problem a customer in San Jose is having with one of our models. You have more experience with this model than anyone else, so would you like to go to San Jose and check it out? Hi, we don't have much to do right now, and you're right. I'm running late this week, so when do you want to see me? Get Kathy right away to get the reservation and tickets, and you can call the client to let them know you're coming and find out what the problem is. That sounds good. I'll look into it. I was starting to feel a little more enthusiastic about life. I can come home, pack my bags, and fly out of here this afternoon and be at the customer's place in the morning. Okay, have a safe trip. I stopped at the desk of Evan's secretary, Kathy, and told her what I needed in terms of flights and reservations, and then stopped at my desk to call a client and determine their problem before heading home to pack. On the way home, I grinned to myself because a plan was already forming in my head that if I finished work quickly, I could surprise my wife with a stop in Denver on the way home. The prospect of spending a couple days with her in Denver was getting more exciting by the minute. While I was waiting for my flight at the airport, I called Anita on her cell phone, but she didn't pick up, so I left a voicemail that I would be staying with my relatives for a couple of days and that she would call me on my cell phone in the evenings. Everything went great. I was at the customer's house on Tuesday morning, made the necessary adjustments to the equipment, and by noon, everything was tested and working satisfactorily. Back at the hotel, I called the airline and boarded a flight that would take me to Denver at 9 p.m. Mountain Time. After checking out of the hotel in San Jose, 
I headed to the San Francisco airport where I had dinner. While I was eating, Anita called me on my cell phone and we talked for a few minutes. She asked how my family was doing, and I answered as if I were at their home. She said the negotiations were progressing, but she was tired and would spend a quiet evening in her hotel room. We said goodbye with expressions of love, and after eating, we boarded my flight. At 9.45, I checked in at the hotel desk in Anita's room, and after verifying my identity, I was given a card to enter her room. As I quietly entered the room, I saw that there was a lamp lit above the computer desk, and her laptop was on it. Closed, but Anita was nowhere to be seen. I put my suitcase down and peeked into the bedroom, but it was empty, as was the bathroom. Well, I thought, she hasn't gone back to her room yet, so I'll sit and wait. Or maybe I'll go down and see if she's there. And then I noticed that the door to the next room was ajar. I approached it, and it opened silently on well-oiled hinges. I looked around the living room in the next room, but saw no one. Puzzled, I stepped into the room, and suddenly I heard a groan from the bedroom. When I walked quietly to the bedroom door, my heart didn't stop, but my breathing quickened. Maybe my heart didn't stop, but my breath quickened at what I saw in the dimly lit room. Anita stood before me, naked, on the bed, next to a man whose face I couldn't see, and his cock was deep inside her. Her eyes were closed, and she was gently riding him in an obvious ecstasy of pre-orgasmic bliss, his hands tweaking her breasts and nipples. My first impulse was to rush over to her and beat the guy to a pulp. But reason overrode emotion, and I slowly backed away from the door and back into her room. Opening my travel bag, I pulled out the digital camera I had brought with me to take some souvenir shots and walked back to the other bedroom door. Turning off the flash and setting the camera to shoot in low light, I stood quietly and took a few shots of the scene on the bed without them noticing my presence. They were both so engrossed in what they were doing that they had their eyes closed and were completely oblivious to their surroundings. Before returning to the room, I checked the open briefcase on the desk, found a business card, and checked the name. Sam Harris, our company's chief negotiator. I put the card in my pocket. When I got back to her room, I pulled out the camera computer interface cable I'd been carrying and connected the camera to her laptop. We had the same photo program on our laptops, so it was easy to download a picture from my camera and set it on her desktop. I then packed my camera in my travel bag and quietly left her room. Before I left, I heard her scream as she experienced an orgasm. I almost cried right there, but continued onto the elevator. After returning the car to the counter, I called the airline to find out when the next flight to St. Louis was leaving. I was lucky that there was a 6.30 a.m. flight that would get me home by 9.30 a.m. If I was lucky, I estimated that would be just about the time Anita would open her laptop at the conference table. That's when she'll realize she's been caught, and she'll also know that our marriage is over. I returned to the airport and checked into a nearby motel where I couldn't sleep. But I kept imagining what I saw in the bedroom at her hotel. I cried and let my distress come out in tears. When I left the motel at 5 o'clock in the morning, I was in tears, and my thought was to consummate our marriage as soon as possible. As I was driving back to St. Louis, my cell phone rang, and I checked the number, seeing it was Anita. I turned it off and headed home. When I walked in the door, the phone was still ringing, but after checking the caller ID, I saw it was Anita again. As I hung up on the answering machine, I heard her crying into the receiver. Jack, please call me immediately. I need to talk to you, darling. It's important. Ignoring her pitiful sobs, I got up and changed, then went and rented a U-Haul it, then went back inside to start packing. If my calculations were correct, she would arrive around 4 in the afternoon, and I wanted to be out of the house by then. It took a few hours, but I managed to get all of my personal belongings out and move them into the rented storage room. Before packing up, I called our attorney and made an appointment with him for the afternoon. After unloading the items in the storage unit, I went to see our attorney and asked him to begin divorce proceedings immediately. I was tempted to cite adultery as the reason, but decided to cite incompatibility and save the adultery in case she wanted to fight for divorce. I also asked him to make a new will naming his brother as a beneficiary. I went into the bank and transferred half of our savings and new account balances into my name only, and then called my investment advisor and did the same with our accounts with him. With a sad heart, I reached my parents' house and taking my suitcase with me, I went up and walked through the open door. My mom saw me first and exclaimed loudly, Jack, where have you been? Anita called here several times looking for you. Did you tell her you were staying here? My father, who had already retired, came over and I sat down at the table and explained everything to them. They were shocked when I told them about Anita's infidelity and that our marriage had broken up. I asked if I could stay with them for a few days until I found an apartment with furniture, and they agreed. 
Apparently, my calculations were pretty accurate because around six in the evening, as we sat down to dinner, the doorbell rang. My father got up to answer it and returned a minute later with Anita behind him, looking very upset. Jack, why didn't you return my calls? I needed to talk to you. You moved all your stuff out of the house. I think the message I left on your desktop will tell you everything you need to know. Oh my god, I was so afraid it was you. Can we go somewhere and talk, honey? Please. Anita, I am no longer your lover, and I have nothing to talk to you about. I have already started divorce proceedings, and our attorneys can relay everything you need to know. What I saw in Denver has completely destroyed all my feelings for you, and I want you to leave so I can finish my dinner. Oh, please, Jack, no. Please don't do this without talking to me. What can you say that would atone for your infidelity? It certainly wasn't the rape I saw and the pictures I have of it. You better call your lover Sam and tell him I'm going after him tomorrow. Maybe his wife will see things better than I do. Oh my God, can't we talk? Please, Jack. Please go, Anita. My dinner is getting cold. I'll tell you what. Why don't you write me a long letter telling me how you can justify breaking your wedding vows? I'm sure a smart lawyer like you can explain that it's all my fault and that you still love and respect me very much. With a sob, she turned away. But before she reached the door, she turned around. Please, Jack, don't end our marriage without talking to me. Goodbye, Anita. After she left, my parents still sat stunned. That was awfully cruel, Jack. Mom, do you want me to show you the pictures of her with her lover? That's what's cruel. She has absolutely no respect for me, and I can't live with that and will never be able to trust her again. Do you want me to give you grandchildren from a woman like that? I know, son, my father finally spoke. Maybe if things cool down a little, you'll be able to look at things differently. I knew my folks really liked Anita. I don't think so, Dad. Let's talk about something else so I can digest my food. All right, son. Anita. That Monday morning as I left the house, I was sorry I had to leave Jack behind, but I thought about how wonderful it would be when I returned and we could start our family. We had waited so long to make sure that financially and career-wise we were ready to be parents. Now everything was almost ready. The trip to Denver went without incident. I sat next to Sam Harris, our chief negotiator, and we talked a little about tomorrow's negotiations and then about what was going on in our families. He knew that when I got pregnant, I would be leaving my job, and he said he would miss me. Sam was 48 years old, married for 20 years, two kids in high school. Sam and I had been on the same negotiating team since before I was married, and we were very comfortable with each other. The other two members of our team sat behind us and had their own conversations. When we got to the hotel in Denver, we checked into our rooms, and as usual, Sam and I got adjoining rooms. This was originally done to facilitate late-night meetings about negotiating intricacies, but about 10 years ago, sex was initiated, and we convinced ourselves that it was a way to relieve stress after a hard day of negotiations. At the time, we told ourselves it wasn't cheating on our wife if it helped us work. Sometimes, we laughed about it. Then, after Jack and I got married, for several years I didn't feel up to it, so we stopped doing it. Finally, during a particularly grueling negotiation, Sam asked if we could do it again to relieve stress and anxiety. I reluctantly agreed, and before I knew it, I was engaging in this activity with him again. The thrill of cheating and not getting caught had greatly increased my libido at home, so it was good for Jack too, and I didn't feel so bad. We did not meet on the first evening of this trip because I felt tired after dinner. However, after the first day of negotiations, I agreed to go to his place the next night. I don't know when or how Jack found out about it or how he got the picture, but when I opened my laptop the next morning and turned it on, I was stunned by what I saw on the screen. Sam was sitting next to me and when he saw it, he quickly slammed the lid shut and asked his coworker on the other end of the table to leave us alone for a few minutes. We carried the laptop out into the hallway. He was furious. What kind of porn do you have on your desktop? He asked. I don't know, Sam. The last time I put it on, it wasn't there. I was still in shock. Let me look at it again. I opened it again, and we looked at the picture together. Oh, shit, it's you, he exclaimed. Aya, uh, how can it be me? I don't know, but it's you. And underneath you, it's probably me, though you can't see my face. Did you leave your laptop unattended yesterday? No, he was with me during the trip and in my room while I was in yours. Could someone have gotten into your room with a camera? I don't think so. The door was closed, and I suppose... Locked. You need to go back to the hotel and try to find out if anyone was given a card to your room last night. I'll handle everything here. Try to contact Jack and find out where he was last night. It couldn't have been him. I talked to him last night at his folks' house. Did you call his parents' cell phone? No, he asked me to call his cell phone. 
Oh, oh, I don't like the sound of that. He could have been anywhere when you talked to him. Call me on my cell phone if you hear anything. Do what you can to undo the damage. Take a cab to the hotel. Okay, bye. I broke into a sweat. If Jack had taken the picture and put it in my laptop, I had to think it was a message that our marriage was over. I had to go back to the hotel and see what I could find out. The girl at the front desk called me a cab, and 15 minutes later, I was at the hotel, first checking at the desk to see if anyone had gotten a card for my room. The clerk checked the computer, and I was informed that Mr. Jack Fillmore had been issued a card at 9.45 the previous evening. The card was returned a half hour later. It was then that I realized that my marriage was probably over. The man I loved more than anything in the world was gone, but I had to fight to get him back. Once I got up to my room, I immediately tried to call his cell phone and his work. His cell phone didn't answer. It was turned off, but I left a voice message that it was important for him to call me as soon as possible. His secretary at work informed me that he was away on company business in California and should be back tomorrow. That was it. He left for California and stopped on the way back to surprise me. I think we were both surprised. After calling his folks, they said they hadn't seen him in a few days. I asked them to ask him to ask him to call me as soon as they could reach him. I called home and got no answer, but left a message there as well. I sat in the room and cried. I didn't have a chance to talk to him unless I went home. So I picked up the phone and booked tickets to get back to St. Louis on the next flight. After packing, I called Sam on his cell phone and told him what I had found out. He was quiet for a minute before he spoke. Anita, I think we're both facing divorce or worse. What could be worse than divorce? The company where we work has a policy against executive level employees fraternizing. We could both be fired. It wouldn't look good in our reports. Oh my God, I should have known that. But as far as I'm concerned, losing Jack would have been much worse. Losing your family would be bad too. But you need to go back to St. Louis and find Jack. Maybe he'll listen to reason. I've already booked tickets for a flight that leaves at noon. I have to be back there by 4.30. For my own sake, I have to find him and talk to him. I'll let you know how it goes. I'll have to stay here until the negotiations are over. I'll be waiting to hear from you. We said goodbye and hung up. Grabbing my bag and laptop, I hurried to the lobby, checked out, and took the hotel limo to the airport. All the way to St. Louis, I prayed that Jack would talk to me. I had to explain that it was just sex, and it didn't affect him in any way. I had to put everything on the line so that he would be unemotional about my infidelity and accept it for what it was. Just meaningless sex. When I got home, I didn't notice anything unusual at first. But when I went into our bedroom and saw that all his clothes and personal belongings were gone, I realized that he knew everything and had left me. I had to find him. After many fruitless phone calls, I finally decided to go to his family to see if he was there or if they had any idea where he was. He was at his in-laws and his reception made me sick with insensitive cruelty. He informed me that he was in the process of filing for divorce and did not want to talk to me that there was nothing I could say that would change his mind. After he sarcastically told me to write him a long letter explaining my position, I left, got in my car, and cried. The family we had planned would never happen. We will never grow old together and enjoy grandchildren together. For selfish reasons, I was even more distressed at the thought that by the time I found another husband, I would be too old to conceive a child. Finally, I started the car and drove back to our empty house. After an incoherent dream, during which I kept seeing Anita and Sam in bed together, I got up early, went down the stairs to my folks' house, and put on coffee. Then I grabbed my laptop and camera and started downloading the pictures from the camera into the computer. I thought about the fact that I would have to see if I could somehow recognize Sam in the pictures. Looking at the pictures, I couldn't make out Sam's face clearly. But then I noticed something on his right arm that was reaching for Anita's chest. Blowing on the spot, I saw what I needed. A tattoo and blowing on it even more, I saw that it was a heart with the word Marie on it. Sam's wife's name was Marie. That was all I needed, so I went back upstairs, showered, and got ready for work. When I got downstairs, my mom was already up and making breakfast. Later at work, I burned a couple CDs of Sam's photos and tattoo. I also printed out a couple sets and put them in a folder. Then I went to our HR department and asked to meet with the manager. After all, Phil and I knew each other, it wasn't that big a company and we played golf together. I pulled some photos out of the folder and laid them out in front of him. What are those, Jack, pornographic pictures? He asked with a smirk. Sorry, Phil. They may look pornographic, but these are my wife and Sam Harris, and you can tell by the date and time on them that they were taken Tuesday night in Sam's hotel room in Denver. They were there in negotiations with the company. Oh, damn, Jack, I'm sorry. What can I do? 
You can fire them both for cause under the anti-paternity clause in their contract with the company. We've never applied this before. Are you sure you want to do this? It'll bring the affair out in the open. I assume that means you're going to divorce Anita over this? I've already instructed my attorney to prepare the papers, but if you don't pursue this matter, I will file a lawsuit against the company. All right, Jack. I'll get this to our legal department and get started. I then went in to see my boss, Evan, to let him know what was going on in my life. He was appropriately horrified that I had told him about my wife and Sam Harris. When I asked for the rest of the week off as a vacation, he readily agreed. In parting, he congratulated me on a job well done on my trip to California. The customer called and complimented me on how quickly I solved their problem and got their production line working again. He also asked if I would consider taking over the territory in California since the current field engineer was retiring for health reasons. I told him I would think about it and give him an answer when I returned to work next week. On my way out of Evan's office, I was stopped by his secretary, Kathy. Jack, your wife has been around looking for you. She said she'd be back later. Kathy, I don't want to see my wife under any circumstances. Please let her know that when she returns. Oh my God, Jack, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize there was a problem. There's a big problem, Kat. We're getting a divorce. She and Sam Harris are dancing the horizontal tango. I knew by noon everyone in the plant would know about it. Katie liked to gossip. Then I went back to my desk and called Marie Harris, Sam's wife. I knew her from the company picnics, and I realized that my revelations about our spouses could be very difficult for her. Marie, it's Jack Fillmore. How are you doing, Jack? I talked to Sam last night and he asked if I'd heard from you, but he didn't say what you might have contacted me about. Marie, we need to talk as soon as possible. Okay, Jack, can you come over now? I have an appointment with my hairdresser at one o'clock, but I'm free right now. Do you still live on Fremont Street? Oh yeah. Okay, I know where you live. I'll be there in 15 minutes. When I arrived at the Harris's, I was filled with dread at what I was about to do to this woman and her family. But I knew Sam shouldn't get away with retribution and let Anita take the fall. Hey, Jack, come on in. Do you want some coffee? I just brewed a fresh one, she asked, inviting me into the living room. That would be lovely, Marie. Just black, please. A moment later, she returned with the coffee and sat down in the chair across from me. So, what is it? I thought about breaking the news to her more gently, but then decided to get it over with as quickly as possible. Marie, I caught your husband and my wife making love in Denver, and I am seeking a divorce from Anita and the dismissal of both of them from their jobs. I hate to tell you this, but it will become public knowledge very soon, and I have decided to prepare you. I have pictures to back up what I am saying if you would like to see them. I watched her face to determine how my words had worked and was surprised at the lack of any real reaction. Jack, I guess I've suspected for a long time that he was flirting with the company, but I hoped it wasn't true. Sam has always been a loving husband and father, and I didn't want to rock the boat, but I realized that someday something would happen and their affair would become public. I guess it did. I'm sorry for you and your marriage, and from my perspective, I'm sorry that Sam might get fired. He's not that old anymore and it will be hard for him to find another job that pays as well. Now I have to decide what I'm going to do. Would you like a set of the pictures I have? Yes, leave them, and I'll try to find the strength to look at them. I'm sorry, Marie, but I just couldn't let that happen. Anita and I were going to start a family, but I can't live with a man I can't trust and I can't respect. The mother of our children should possess both. I understand, Jack. Thank you for telling me. I wouldn't have wanted to hear about it from any other source first. And let me tell you again how sorry I am for you and Anita. I'm sure she's just as devastated and remorseful as Sam is when she finds out I know about his affair. I wish it had been a one-time thing. Then it would have been easier to forgive. But I believe it went on for years. And it's hard to accept now that everything is out in the open. I have my pride, and I should be able to keep my cool. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know, I told her, leaving and heading back to my parents' house. Epilogue. It's been six months since I initiated divorce proceeding. This morning, I received a copy of the divorce agreement with Anita. I have not spoken to her or seen her again since she arrived at my parents' house. Everything was handled by my attorney. I gave her the mortgaged house with furniture and furnishings with large sums of money on it so that she would waive all claims against me. I also took my name off the mortgage. She took full responsibility for the payments. Of course, with no job, she had to put the house up for sale and lost her shirt on that deal. She tried to contest the divorce, but I threatened to change the cause of divorce to adultery and put pictures of her with Sam on the internet if she didn't sign the papers within 48 hours. She signed them within the deadline, and so, today I am a free man. I guess she decided she didn't need me that much. Anyway, she was fired from her job, but 
She's a smart lawyer and negotiator, so within a month, she found another one. Doesn't make as much money and doesn't have the benefits that seniority at her previous job gave her. But I hear she's doing well and is dating again. Best of luck to her friend if she finds him. I wonder if she told him about our divorce and the reasons for it. Maybe I should enlighten him. Marie divorced Sam and financially screwed him over. He also found another job after the layoff. But with his new salary, he is having a hard time paying child support and alimony. I currently live in Santa Maria, California, in a quiet place by the coast, about halfway between the Bay Area and Los Angeles. This allows me to work in both the southern and northern parts of the state. I moved here about four months ago and rented an apartment in a complex with other singles and young couples, most of whom are trying to save up for a down payment on a house. Housing costs are high here, and it takes a lot of money to get into the market. I have a steady friend who lives in the same complex. She is divorced like me, but we are comfortable together, and I think we will see how things work out in the future. Since I'm traveling so much, I need to trust whoever I marry. But I need to step up early if we want to start a family. The biological clock keeps ticking.